Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Bless your kingdom come, Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Forever and ever the kingdom is yours. It's yours, it's yours. you will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart on earth as in heaven Good morning. morning. Isn't it a blessing to be in the Lord's house today? We have a few short announcements. We're planning a baby shower for Taryn Ricketts on Sunday, November 12th. That's next Sunday. From 2 to 4, it'll be taking place in the dining hall. The youth events, we have a game night coming up on Friday, November 10th from 3 to 8. They'll be having a game night here for the junior high students, and they'll have all kinds of stations and some good times. They're off school that day, so get with Keaton, and he can give you more details. The last Wednesday night meal will be November 15th, starting at 5. This will be our annual Thanksgiving Day meal. So come and bring your appetite, enjoy some fellowship, and a good meal. Children's events on Saturday, November 11th from 2 to 3, they'll be having turkey tag in the gymnasium. You can get up with Michelle if you have any questions on that. The SAS will be meeting the 12th and the 19th. And a very important announcement, Elijah Eggleston is leaving tomorrow for Army BMT. So if you get a chance, thank him, and let's send all our prayers out to him. He's going to serve our country. It's a great calling. Lastly, after service today, if you haven't seen it, heard it, we've got a giant feed going on in the back, great fellowship, great feed, and this is the anniversary of our church. All right, folks, let's go ahead and stand up for Jesus.
those hands. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Lift up his banner high. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Lift up his banner high. Oh, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we raise you up. A high banner. He is worthy of our praises, church. Amen. And if he stands... If we stand with him, if he's standing for us, who can possibly stand against us? There is none. Amen? Oh, what a mighty God we serve. And a holy and pure and true and just God, the land Savior. Let's sing that song, Holy Forever. thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land and all who come before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name it stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry and pure 
We are thankful that what you say you will do. Amen. You may be seated. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes all. Displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Let's stand and sing the chorus, folks. Oh, your grace. So free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, we're free, free forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the great price that you paid, a price that you did not owe, and a debt we could never possibly pay. So thank you, Father. Death was arrested on that cross, church, and we are redeemed. We are free. We will be with him for an eternity. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
morning, church. So as I was thinking about my communion meditation uh, this week, which I found out about last week because I don't pay attention to the schedules they put out, um, I got to think about some hobbies and stuff I do. One of my biggest hobbies, I go backpacking and I hike a lot. One of the biggest things about that is survival. That's kind of what draws me to it. And when you think about survival, there's three main things you got to think about. Water, fire, and shelter. Now, really thinking about it, there's four that I never take into account, which is breathing. If I can't breathe, I can't survive. Now, none of my tricks of the trade help me breathing. So I got thinking a little more on that. Like, what really is breathing? Like, what's so important about it? When I was in the military, uh, they, they taught us what's called square breathing. It's actually something I've taught my daughter. And it's a way to calm your mind, kind of reset your heart rate when you're going into either a scary situation or, you know, something just happened to us. Uh, it's, it's actually a really good thing we use throughout is breathing. So then I got thinking, well, I could use this for my communion meditation. So what's the biblical answer to what is breathing? Simple, simply put, is breathing is God's name. So in Exodus chapter 3, 13 through 15, Moses gets up the courage to ask God, what's your name? Now, it's, I'm ad-libbing there a little bit. Uh, but that's how I read it. I said, hey, what, what, what's your name? I'm going out and talking to the Israelites, trying to bring them out of Egypt. Who am I going to tell them sent me? Now, God's answer in my translation, all the translations of the Bibles I have, says, I am who I am. And then he goes on in verse 15. It says, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers. Now, down in the footnotes of there where it says the Lord, it says is Yahweh. Now, Yahweh, as we spell it, Y-A-H-W-E-Y, is incorrect. See, we as a people and the vast languages we have, we like to add vowels to stuff because vowels are how we pronounce stuff. The Yahweh in the original Hebrew is Y-H-W-H, which if you really think about that is the sound of breathing. Y-H being your inhale. W-H exhale. So tying this back to survival, when I'm in a tough situation or you're in a fearful situation, you take that deep breath to really calm yourself. You're calming yourself with the name of God. He gave us his very name as our first breath all the way to our last breath. You have to breathe nonstop to survive. You are constantly speaking the name of God throughout your life for your bare essential survival. So with that in mind, let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for all you've given us. We uh, thank you for the emblems that we're about to partake to represent the broken body and the spilled blood of your son for our eternal survival. And we thank you for your name, the essence of our daily survival here on life until we can meet you again in your kingdom. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, CCO. Happy 45th birthday. That's today we're celebrating that. I'm glad you were all here for that. Um, As we tuck into our time of the word, why don't we stand up? We're going to let the kids go back to uh, Children's Church. The rest of you wish one another a happy church birthday. There you go. How you doing, sir? No Ibanez today. No Ibanez (laughs) today. We have a big day planned here. I hope you're, uh, you're planning to stick around for lunch afterwards. After church, we've got that going on. Um, After we spend some time in the Word, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to offer some invitations. If you'd like to come forward and place your church membership here, we'd love to have you. Uh, If you'd like to rededicate your life to the Lord or the church, you can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, We're going to do that as well. Um, But first, let's spend some time in the Word. Are you ready for that? Oh, you're still chatting, which I absolutely love. That's the greatest sound. Did I do that? Did, that, did you see that? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Am I? Anyway. Let's pray. Lord, thanks so much for this day and for the time you've given us to open up your word and to consider its truth for our lives. Lord, as we uh, do so, would you please uh, move within us, mold us and shape us, and to the people you've called us to be, give us the right thoughts about you or the right path forward. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. I missed you folks. I was gone for a couple of Sundays, and now I'm back, and it feels like there's more of you. I should stay away. That's the point of all of that. But it's great to see all of you this morning, and uh, I say that sincerely. I've missed you. I got to see some of you on Wednesday night. We've started our adult Bible study on Wednesday night uh, in the Gospel of Mark, and so uh, it was fun. I heard a quote recently, and I can't remember where I heard it, but I'm going to share this quote with you anyway because I think it's good. I tell you that, I just don't want you to think I made this up, okay? But I heard somebody say this, uh, nobody ever gave their life to Jesus because they lost an argument. Nobody ever gave their life to Jesus because they lost an argument. That, that's good, isn't it? It's probably true. I mean, you hear the random story about a, a journalist who, you know, will uh, argue themselves into faith. That's Lee Strobel's story in his book, The Case for Christ. But usually people don't get argued or debated into putting their faith and trust in Jesus. Usually, we know this just from statistically speaking, we know that most people get relationshiped in. People don't get argued into the faith. They get relationshiped into the faith. And I know that's not really a verb, but I'm making up a word today, and I can do that because I have the microphone. All right? (laughs) But I want you to think a moment about why you decided to put your faith and trust in Jesus. As I was preparing for our time uh, together, I was thinking about that moment in my life. What was it that moved me in that direction? Uh, CCO is celebrating 45 years of uh, existence as a church family today. And it occurred to me, 45 years ago, I gave my life to the Lord. Easter Sunday, 1978. Why did I do that? It's because of a relationship. There was this guy at First Christian Church of Evansville. I was born and raised in uh, 
Bethesda, Maryland, suburb of Washington, D.C. My mother was born and raised in Evansville, and so when my parents split, she took us home. And so at 10, I found myself in Evansville, Indiana, and at First Christian Church there. One weekday morning, my mother had gone down to talk to her pastor. Paul was his name. And the youth pastor at the time was a guy named David Clark. And I remember uh, Pastor Paul asking David, hey, could you hang out with Brian while I talk to his mom? Paul was the one who had married my parents and wanted to know what, what went so terribly wrong. David took me to the gym and we started playing basketball. Now, one thing you need to know about me is I love the sport of basketball and I am terrible at the sport of basketball. <laughs> I love to watch other people play it. I'm not so good at it. But David was just really talking to me, paid attention to me. I had a difficult time in my life. And, and I remember this to this day. He had a Polaroid camera. And he said, take, take a shot. I'll get your picture. And I did. And there's this picture of me just making a horrible basketball shot. But in that moment, vulnerable 10-year-old kid whose life was completely upside down, this guy saw me noticed me, paid attention to me, even took a picture. I paid attention to what he had to say about Jesus. Five or six months later, I gave my life to the Lord and was baptized there at First Christian Church of Evansville, Easter Sunday, 1970. I didn't get argued into the faith. There was a guy who cared about me, who told me about Jesus. I didn't get argued in. I got relationshiped in. What about you? Somebody told you about the Lord. And most likely, based upon your relationship with them, that was a meaningful expression of the truth. Maybe it was a grandparent who really loved you and wanted you to know the truth about reality and about heaven and all those good things. Maybe it was a friend who told you who Jesus is and what he's all about. And because of your friendship and your respect for that person, you thought, well, I should probably pay attention to this. Or, or maybe it was uh, godly parents, right? Who not only told you the truth, but showed you the truth in their lives. And you thought, man, this is the way to live, but it's also the way to believe. And so you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Those relationships often are, usually are, the catalyst for somebody putting their faith and trust in Jesus. And since that's true, since many of us, most of us really, statistically speaking, get relationshiped in rather than debated in, the way we interact with one another about the Lord is important. The way we talk to each other, the words we use, not in argument or debate, but just in conversation, the way we talk to other people about Jesus matters. I want to walk you through a passage of scripture this morning that says so. If you brought your Bible with you, I would encourage you to open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're con continuing our study uh, of Paul's letter to Timothy, the second letter he wrote, he wrote this end of his life. He's got months to live at this point, and he's kind of passing on all those last-minute important messages before he goes away. And by away, I mean goes home to be with the Lord. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 with me. I want to read it for you, and then we'll go back and, and talk about it just a little bit. Paul says this, or writes this rather, in 2 Timothy 2, 22. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they just produce quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. 
Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. If you paid close attention to what I was reading there, you'll see that the gist of this passage is really all about how we talk to people about Jesus. Paul starts out by telling Timothy, don't get into arguments. He must have known. Nobody gets argued into a relationship with Jesus. Nobody ever gave their life to the Lord, generally speaking, because they lost a debate. That's what this passage is about. It's about how we talk to one another about the Lord. And so Paul begins this conversation with his son in the faith, Timothy, by telling him to flee. What does he say? Flee the evil desires of youth. Now, most of us have been taught that that means one thing, and we've probably been taught incorrectly. Nobody had bad intention. Paul's not talking about the things we usually think he's thinking about, right? He's not talking about youthful hormones run amok. I'm just going to say that and in that statement. This passage is about arguing. And so Paul is talking to Timothy about those impulses that sometime accompany youth. Paul wanted Timothy to uh, avoid arguing with people. He didn't want him to get uh, stuck in impatience and intolerance, some things that typically characterize youth. He didn't want him to get stuck into the love of arguing, things that typically characterize youth. If you're a parent, you would amen that. Because you know, they get good at arguing, don't they? Now, I don't say this as a disparaging uh, comment against young people. I, I just remember my tendency when I was a young person um, to be right all the time. Especially after I had one semester of Bible college under my belt. I remember coming home on Christmas break after one semester of Bible college and arguing theology with my grandmother. Why? It's because I had to be right. Paul's saying, listen, there's this impulse to be right. But stay away from that. Stay away from impatience and intolerance and rather... Focus on the right things with the right people. That's what Paul says next in verse 22, right? He says, instead, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Pursue those things that build relationships. Righteousness, live well. Love, peace, good things. And pursue those things, he says, with people who are also pursuing those things, with people who are pursuing Jesus. And the, I think the way to understand verse 22 is pursue the right things with the right people. People who will encourage you in your pursuit of those things. And then, from that posture of doing our best to live well and pursue love and peace and put our faith and trust in Jesus, from that posture, then... Let's talk about how we talk. That, that's where Paul goes next. From this posture of living a life that pursues peace and love, here are some things you need to remember when talking to people about Jesus, Timothy, and Brian, and Christian Church of Alney. And Paul doesn't really present us a list in this passage, but I've kind of found a list in there. And I like to talk to you, and, I, and, and this is going to, I don't know if it'll help you or not. I hope it sure does, because it's in the scriptures, I think. But, but I see in these next few verses, six rules. Just six. Don't worry. You hear that, you're three, you're okay. Six, oh, he's going to go long. I'm really not. We're just going to be able to hit these pretty quick. But six rules to follow when talking to people about Jesus. Six simple rules. And uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to suggest that not only are these good rules to follow when you're talking to people about Jesus, they're also good rules to follow when you're talking to people. Right? 
But the conversation here that he's having with Timothy is, here's how you talk about your faith. I'm going to suggest that this might just be a great way to talk to people. But we'll, we'll bounce on both themes a little bit. And the first rule he gives us is right there at the very beginning of verse 23. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. So I wasn't allowed to say stupid when I was growing up as a kid. My mom was like, that's a bad word. But it's in the Bible, so I can say it. But correct me to your children if you need to, if they're still here. It's interesting the words that Paul actually uses here. Uh, foolish is, is a, a word from which we get our word moronic. And by stupid, he means uninformed, uneducated. Don't many of us, not, uh, don't many people, not the people in this room, but don't many people run into arguments without really knowing what they're talking about or just partial information. Paul says, you know what, stay away from that kind of stuff. You know, and I don't know what people in Timothy's day were arguing about when it comes to the faith. I don't, maybe they were arguing, did Adam have a belly button? Let's take sides and fight. I, I don't know. Phantom had a belly button. Probably not. I, I don't know. It, who cares? Right? But the church has divided over sillier things. Chairs or pews. Church is split. Color of carpet. The worship wars of the 80s and 90s. Hymns or worship songs. Right? And I say yes, please. Back in the day, before any of us had anything to do with this stuff, they were arguing over whether or not it was biblical to have a kitchen at your church. Don't turn God's house into a blah, blah, blah. Like, seriously, how would we live at CCO without a kitchen? Amen? <laughs> On the way here this morning, uh, driving from uh, Watson, I was telling Stacey, you know one of the things this church does so well is I feed people. I feed people so well. And I, and I mean that, seriously, as, as, as a compliment. It's an expression of hospitality, which is, is wonderful. But then non-believers sometimes try to debate us into foolish arguments. They'll say things like, well, if God is pro-life, why did he send the Israelites to war? And they'll try to pull us or bait us into these arguments that question the foundational truths of our faith. Really, they're making a... Uh, just a category mistake there. But Paul says, listen, when, when people approach you and want to argue about these things with your faith, or what, just don't. Avoid foolish arguments. Because the only thing that arguments produce, Paul says, and I think he's right, the only thing arguments produce is more arguments. Nobody ever got debated, argued into a relationship with Jesus. So that's, that's rule number one. Don't worry, I'm going to pick up speed here. In just a minute. The second thing Paul says is don't go looking for a fight. Avoid arguments and then don't be the person who goes looking for a fight. He says it right here in verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Some people go looking for arguments when it comes to their faith. Some people love to pick these fights. I'll tell you a story about a guy who's not here. Um, years and years ago, it seems like so long ago, 15 years ago or so, I was teaching at a non-denominational Christian university in uh, the Phoenix area. I had a buddy named John. I'm using his real name, but I won't share his last name with you. I had a buddy named John, and he and I... Um, we were trained in the same seminary. We, our beliefs were right in line. The school that we went to was broadening their doctrinal statement a little bit, kind of redefining uh, what they believed about Scripture so that more Christians, again, non-denominational, they wanted it so more denominations would feel comfortable sending their young people to this school. Good school. Uh, nothing bad to say against it because there are other flavors of Christians besides us. Amen. Um, and so they were opening the doors a little bit, and John was offended because that doctrinal statement was taking 
things away from his narrow interpretation of Scripture, he was so offended that he started to approach board members. Did you know the new president is redefining the doctrinal statement? Sorry, the microphone's on this side. And the emergency board meeting was called, and the president was being rebuked. And then what happened was the president was John's boss. So the president pulled him in. It was just a big mess, a big argument. John came to me, and he said, aren't you uh, offended by this stuff? Now, he didn't know that I had been raised in the independent Christian church. Where I had been taught to pay attention to the things we agree about more than the things we disagree about. Amen? I don't know if you've heard this, but when I was a Bible college student at Johnson Bible College and Pacific Christian College, I was taught in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things love. Let's agree on the essentials. If someone wants to have an opinion about something else, that's fine. Anyway. John comes to me and is like, aren't you offended about this? Why don't you say something? And I said, well, here's the difference, John. I do say something. You're right. We are the same in terms of our belief. The great difference is I'm just not a jerk about it. Because he wanted to fight. And I wanted to agree. Not change my positions, but to agree on what was flexible. Paul said, and I, you know, I don't like to make myself the hero of a story because I'm, I'm not. But Paul says, look, don't be the kind of person who goes looking for a fight. I think it's wonderful. Our movement was established, you know this, back in the 1820s. Several phrases characterized our particular non-denominational denomination. And one of the big phrases was, we are not the only Christians, but Christians only. When I got to uh, grad school, I I was raised in this, and so when I got to grad school, people would ask me, what what, what kind of Christian, you know, what are you, I'm I'm a Christian, well, like, what kind of Baptist, Pentecostal, I just just thought there was Christians, right? Because our movement was founded as a unity movement, not Unitarian, but Let's agree with other Christians. You don't have to argue with your Methodist grandma after one semester of Bible college. She can be Methodist. It's okay. Right? Paul says, you know, don't go picking a fight. Don't be a quarrelsome kind of person. When it comes to your faith in Jesus, don't be that way with others. Don't use your faith as boxing gloves. Enter into respectful conversations. Now, that's our faith. What about personally? Do not come home after a long day's work and pick a fight. Somebody there has probably done something that will irritate you on some level because you're already irritated from a long day of work. Paul's saying, don't be quarrelsome. And the great thing about our New Testament is when it tells us not to be one way, It also tells us how to be instead. And so how do we avoid being quarrelsome, argumentative people? Right back here at verse 24, Paul tells us, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind. That's the third rule for talking to people about Jesus. The first rule is avoid foolish arguments. The second rule... Don't go looking for a fight. The third rule, be kind. To who? To everyone. You know and I know that kindness and respect are those building blocks of any relationship, right? I mean, you don't want to be in a relationship with someone who's not kind to you. You don't want to be in a relationship with somebody who doesn't respect you. Remember, people get relationshiped into a relationship with Jesus. And this is what I think. And you can check me on this, what you think about this next statement. But I I really, I honestly think that our kindness, our kindness is a tool God uses to introduce himself to others through us. Our kindness is a tool God uses to introduce himself to others 
through us. That's what was happening on that basketball court with that, that day with David Clark. God was introducing himself to me through the kindness of a man who saw a scared and hurting kid. And we can be that vehicle of kindness as well that introduces others to the Lord too. And notice this, we're told to be kind to the people we like. That's not what it says. To be kind to everyone. Everyone. Not just the people we like. Not just people who agree with us uh, on uh, arguments. Even people on the other side of debates. We're told here in scripture to be kind to everyone. And it occurs to me that that's, that's really how Jesus did it. Listen to this statement the Apostle John makes about our Lord In John chapter 1, verse 14, he says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. That's how Jesus approached other people. From a position of grace. Extending someone kindness, mercy, and then truth. Always in that order. Grace first, then truth. If you get it out of order and you're just truthful and using your faith as a boxing glove, the grace that follows that, well, that just doesn't really matter. You're a jerk when talking to somebody, but following it up with, well, you know, I'm a, and, and all they're stuck on is that first moment of encounter. So how, how do we talk about our faith? I would suggest we do it the way Jesus did and we do it with kindness. We also hear another rule, uh, rule number four, know your stuff. Let me uh, pick it up here right after the phrase, you must be kind to everyone. Uh, Well, no, I'll pick it up at the beginning of the verse. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach. Able to teach. I think what Paul is suggesting here is that when we step into conversations with people about our faith, we should know our stuff. Like, well, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be. Able to teach means ready to explain stuff. And I think this is a, a, an encouragement for us to, to know our faith story, to know the truth of Scripture. And like I said, you don't have to be a preacher, you don't have to be a Sunday school teacher to do that. I would suggest that you just need a steady diet of Bible and interaction about it. You can do that with your Bible at home. You can plug into uh, one of our great Sunday school classes here. We have an adult Bible school, uh, an adult Bible study on Wednesday night in addition to amazing things happening for kids and young people, our youth groups. But it's important when we talk to people about our faith that we actually know something about what we're talking about. We don't have to know everything, but we need to know some things. Often people step into discussions with partial information. I think it's important for us to do our best to know the truth. Paul is going to talk about the truth quite a bit in the next chapter. So he's priming Timothy's pump here. Rule number five, don't hold a grudge. Don't hold a grudge. Six rules. How to tell people the truth the right way or the right way to tell the truth. Or how to talk to people about your faith. Rule number six. uh, Rule number five is don't hold a grudge. Do you see it there at the end of verse 24? Be kind to everyone, able to teach, and not resentful. We're told to not be resentful. And this is a tough one to talk about because we don't like to talk about the grudges that we're holding against a person. And many people will tell you, well, I, I, I don't hold grudges, and that's great, and I, and I hope that's true. But some of us have been deeply wounded by people. And it's hard not to treat them the way they treated us, right? I'm just trying to be honest with you here. It's hard not to treat them The way they treat us. But we're we're told here when interacting with other people, we should not hold grudges. And especially when it comes to our faith. You could say, well, I'm not going to talk to that person about Jesus because they they stole my parking spot at Walmart. 
Or, or I'm not going to talk about Jesus to those people because I don't want them to come to my church. I don't want to have to see them every Sunday. Paul's like, you know, we got to let that stuff go. We got to let that stuff go when it, comes, when it comes to the sake of the gospel because grudges, if left unchecked, can really keep us from sharing our faith with people who need it. Share your faith in Jesus with those people and maybe they won't be so cantankerous, right? Share your faith in Jesus with those people and maybe they will be the kind of people you want to go to church with. Because sometimes grudges keep us from telling people about the Lord, telling people who really need to hear what we have to say about him. So let's not be resentful, amen? Uh, the Bible will say, uh, keep short accounts in another passage. The idea is don't, don't keep a long list of grudges. I have friends in my life who can tell you, can pinpoint the day when something bad happened to them. They'll mark an anniversary of a time when somebody did something rude to them. And I don't understand that. Because if you're paying attention to an anniversary of a time that you were mistreated, then you have to relive that once a year. I don't know. I'm no psychologist. I just, I don't want that. Stuff swirling around in my head. I don't want to be naive about it either. But here's rule number six. Be gentle when correcting others. It's right here in verse, uh, verse uh, 25. Opponents must be gently corrected. Paul's talking about when it's time to actually, okay, we, we've come up against a disagreement here. And there's no way around it. I can't avoid it. I'm certainly not looking for it. When there's no way around it. Paul says, be gentle. Be gentle with it. When it's time to set things straight, do it with gentleness. Gentleness. We can't be looking for opportunities to verbally jab people or burn people. You know, one of the things that's most disheartening to me is that when I see my Christian friends post political things on social media and they'll be like, you know, quote, um, own the libs or something like that. And, and the idea is that, you know, it's some kind of a verbal burn to somebody. And listen, I, I, I'm not making a political statement about which way to believe politically or anything like that. I'm just thinking that's pretty uncivil. Oh, I got that guy. That's, that's pretty uncivil. We're being told here, let, let's be civil Let's be gentle. Let's be respectful. And again, I, I think about some interesting conversations that Jesus had. And that's how he did it. Remember his interaction with the, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. She wanted to argue theology. He was gentle. Set her straight, but did it gently. I'm also thinking about his interaction with the Pharisees and the lady caught in adultery in the beginning of John chapter 8 there. And I see some gentleness there. Even toward the Pharisees when he says, you know, if you've never sinned, go ahead and throw a rock at her. And then he asks her, where, where are the people who accuse you? Of course, they were gone. And so he grants her forgiveness and grace and says, don't do what you were doing anymore. Gentleness is the way uh, we're called in Scripture through the words of the apostles here in 2 Timothy and through the, rep the example of Jesus. This is the way we're called to interact with people we don't agree with. Do it gently. Do it gently. Because remember, people get relationship into a relationship with Jesus. Nobody ever gave their life to Jesus because they lost an argument. And if we follow these just simple rules of how to interact with others about our faith, look what could possibly happen for them. Verse 25, uh, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope. Here's what could happen if we follow these rules. In the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them 
captive to do his will. If we, if we follow these simple rules, when talking to people about Jesus, they could get free from the devil. I find it just a couple quick takeaways here. First of all, the people that we think are our in, the people that we think are our enemies, they're not the enemy. It's the devil who's taken them captive. And if you and I talk gently to them, if we don't bait them into arguments, if we follow these little rules, if we're kind to them, if we follow these little rules, they might they stand a better chance of finding their freedom and escaping captivity than they would otherwise. And so I'm just going to suggest that maybe we just, in our interactions with others about our faith, just maybe keep some of these rules in mind. Don't get pulled into, pulled into foolish arguments. Not a good idea. Don't go looking for a fight. Be kind to everybody. Know your stuff. Don't hold a grudge. And be gentle when correcting others. These are six rules that we should follow when talking to people about our faith. And as I mentioned earlier, I think these are just six rules to follow <laughs> when talking to people. This is the kind of person the Lord was. And this is the kind of person that he calls us to be. And so let's just be this way. Amen? But especially when we're talking about Jesus. Would you stand with me as I pray us out of this time? Lord, we thank you so much for the time you've given us to open up your word and to consider its truth. Lord, we are just reminded that you want us to talk to people the way you did. So we pray. As we interact with the, the people closest to us, our family members, our, our husbands, our wives, parents, friends, as we interact with those folks, would you please... Bring some of these little rules to mind, guidelines, if you will. Lord, we love you, and we want to live well for you here at CCO. Uh, we want to do that with you and together. And so as we uh, bring this time of studying your word to a close today, I pray that you would remind us of this as we go through our lives this week. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, every Sunday here at CCO, we like to offer an invitation. Um, we've been talking about Jesus a lot, like he's important. He is. God himself in human flesh come to earth to show us what God is really like. And to offer us grace and redemption. He promises us that if we put our faith and trust in him, he will save us from sin, death, hell, and even ourselves. And so we are going to extend an invitation to you this morning. If you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus, why don't you go ahead and do that while we sing. I've carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, I'm laying it down. I know that I need you. Run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh. You saw my condition, had a plan for the start. Your son for redemption. don't have context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I've run to the Father, I've fallen to grace. 
I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. special invitation this Sunday uh, here at CCO. Uh, membership in a church is important. And uh, there are no dues or anything like that. Just gifts to the Lord if you want to do that. But uh, it's been a while since we invited people to formally place their membership here at CCO. I don't know how long it's been. Maybe pre-pandemic or something like that. If things changed and we want to get them back to uh, sanity, if you will, in this area. Here's what membership at CCO means. It means that you are a part of our family. It means you can count on us. It means we can count on you. And whatever way the Lord leads. I don't have a, uh, you know, a preconceived idea in mind. The Holy Spirit knows what he'll do in that area. But it's important for you to place your, uh, to plant your spiritual roots somewhere. And I've talked to some people over the last few weeks who said, you know, I, I've, I've been coming here. I've, I've never done that. Well, today is a good day to do that. We're going to sing another song here in, in just a moment. Give you an opportunity to place your membership. You'll just come forward and there'll be people up here and we'll, we'll do a thing. Don't worry. Um, seriously, don't, don't worry. We also want it to be a time where if, if you need to rededicate your commitment to the church, your commitment to the Lord. We want to give you a chance to make a public expression of that by just coming forward. And we'll pray together and we'll uh, repeat our confession of faith together. Membership here at CCO involves uh, being a baptized uh, believer in Jesus. We have a baptistry here. I brought my baptism clothes. We could take care of that. If that's something you're interested in. But we want to give you an opportunity to come forward and, and, and say, you know, I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. I want to rededicate my life to this church. I want to place my membership in this church. It's our 45th birthday. It's a big day for us. It's a day about looking back and remembering every great thing that God has done through the ministry of this church and looking forward to all the great things that we expect him to do in the coming years, decades, however long. Amen? So, as we sing this uh, next song again, I'm just going to invite you to come forward. Uh, come up here. And uh, if you can stay standing, that's awesome. Gives you a chance to get out of somebody's way. Um, if you can't, if you need to sit down, I totally get it. My bad. I get it. Um, but let's give people an opportunity to publicly express their commitment this morning as we sing another chorus. Run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a 
surgeon, my soul means a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, thanks for coming forward, and thanks for expressing your commitment to dedicate your life to the Lord. I know I'm talking to people who have been uh, believers for a long, long time, and also to dedicate yourself uh, here uh, as uh, uh, people of CCO. I'm just going to ask you, and in fact, I'm going to ask all of you who name the name of Jesus to repeat your confession of faith after me as I phrase it for you. And this will be the way we formally express our commitment to the Lord. Does that sound good? Yes. Awesome. So here we go. Uh, please just repeat after me as I phrase this for you. I believe, I believe that, Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The of the living God. He's, my he's my Lord and he's my Savior. He's my Savior. Amen. And isn't that awesome? Huh? That's what we believe about Jesus here. Well, I'm going to close this in prayer, okay? And then I'm just going to go ahead and dismiss everybody. Is that all right? Uh, because we're going to have lunch together, and we like to talk and fellowship with one another. And so let me close you uh, in, in a prayer. Actually, you know what I want to do? I, let me do something I haven't done here before. I just want to offer a blessing on you. Just, it's not a... I, I, Lord, would you bless these people? Would you smile on them every moment of their lives? Would you keep them safe, healthy? Would you give them an opportunity to share the joy they have because of Jesus? Protect us as we go. Bless our fellowship together. I pronounce this blessing in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Have a great week. We'll see you.